let's just wait for participants to start joining. Thank you, Maryam, for, me, for being putting us live. Let's just wait a little bit uh, as people start trickling in. Let's just wait one more minute and then we'll we'll get going. We have attendees just slowly coming in. everyone in Armenia is uh, tired of <laughs> of the event today so let's let's see if more people are going to join and we'll start in exactly one minute beautiful thank you Mariam so let's get going everyone I see that we have eight people here on the Zoom and we have about 33, 34 people on Facebook. Uh, nice to meet you everyone, nice to see everyone. My name is Alex Medarissian, I'm here in Canada and I have a great group of panelists today so I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Um, so today I'll be your moderator. So I'll be the, the referee making sure that we stick to time and everyone respects the rules and that we animate the chat. So uh, today everyone, um, please, if you have comments and questions, please post them in the chat at any time. I'll integrate them into the conversation as we go through the panel. We are gonna be speaking for exactly one hour. So at noon Eastern time, the event will end exactly. So we're not gonna go over that time. Um, and please in the chat while, we're, uh, while we, we talk and I give a bit of the housekeeping rules and how we're gonna be structured today, please post in the chat where you're from. We'd, like, we'd love to hear where you guys are from. At the last event we did two, three weeks ago, we had people from all over the world. So it was very interesting, uh, very interesting conversation. Today we'll be talking in English, but please feel free uh, to also put comments in the chat in French. Uh, if you wanna put comments in Armenian, that's fine as well. So please feel free to put um, uh, your comments in the chat. That's how we're gonna to function today. Uh, just before we start, make sure, as of today, I'm, I'm looking right now on the website, we're at 78,000 signatories of the future Armenian. Uh, we have to hit 100. So please, if you haven't done so already, please start, uh, uh, please go on the website, sign. It takes literally 30 seconds and join the cause and show your support for the 15 objectives. Uh, I'd just like to congratulate everyone. I mean, you're all taking time out of your busy Sundays to come and listen to this, to be part of this movement, and you're choosing to be Armenian. And you know, some people might be thinking, well, choosing to be Armenian, I'm born Armenian. No, you're not. If you're living, especially if you're living outside of Armenia, you're choosing to be Armenian today. Many of us are even half Armenian. I'm, I'm half French Canadian, half Armenian. I'm choosing to be Armenian. So that's the case also for Maral, and I'll let her talk about her experience a bit later. So thank you for choosing to be Armenian as well. Um, after our first discussion two, three weeks ago, which was about goal number one, and it was a broader conversation, we realized there was a tremendous amount of interest around immigration and repatriation. And so today is the first part of multiple discussions around goal number nine and goal number five, but mainly goal number nine, around how do we grow Armenia's population? 
And today we're really, really happy to have a great group of panelists who have all different experiences with regards to immigrating to Armenia. Uh, the first guest we have is Margarita Bagdasarian from the Diaspora Commissioner's Office. And she'll be talking for about five to seven minutes about uh, her vision of repatriation, the vision of her commission, and also what they're doing to make immigration and repatriation easier for Armenians and also non-Armenians, but Armenians across the world. We have David Tavadian, who's a co-founder of the movement of Future Studios and the Future Armenian. And he uh, was the main speaker in our first event. So thank you, David, from Moscow for joining. We have Maral Elliott, the famous Maral Elliott, who's also the sister of Rafi and Patrick. Uh, I never thought I'd be saying that one day, Maral, but uh, every time we're on a call, somebody mentions Rafi and Patrick. So thank you for being there from Montreal. And we have Seban Rezian, who for a while was also a repatriate and who might one day move back to Armenia. So she'll give us her experience. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping, everyone. Uh, David needs to leave a bit earlier today. So don't be surprised if he just drops off about at around 11.30 Eastern time. So on that happy note, uh, Margarita, I think we can call ourselves by our first name. So please take the floor, walk us through the vision of your commission's office, give us and the people who are attending your perspective on how repatriation and immigration is going in Armenia, what needs to change and what you guys are doing. Sure, thank you, Alex. Um, again, I'm very, very happy to be here and to be joining this conversation. Um, just a little bit of introduction about myself. Um, I was born in Armenia and I moved to the United States with my family when I was 10 years old. Um, I lived in Los Angeles, I went to school uh, in UCLA, and then I got my master's degree. Um, and after getting my master's degree, I decided that I wanted to move to Armenia. So I moved to Armenia in um, early 2020. And I've been living here for a year and a half already. It's been a very, very difficult year and a half, but it's been very exciting. And um, with all of the difficulties, especially with the war that we saw, it's also wonderful to see um, the response to it from the Armenian community, from Armenian communities from around the world, who for a lot of people, it was a catalyst to move to Armenia, to want to do something for Armenia, to change, uh, to change something in Armenia. So. Um, that's been a sort of the positive side of the war, and we're happy to see that. Um, a little bit about the Office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs. For those of you who don't know, the Office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs essentially replaced uh, the former Ministry of Diaspora Affairs. Um, it's a bit smaller within its structure, but um, it functions a little bit differently. It's currently situated within the Office of the Prime Minister. Um, so, uh, in general, we are responsible for developing and implementing the strategies and policies for Armenia diaspora relations. Um, we work on supporting and encouraging repatriation, ensuring an active integration process, mapping the diaspora's potential, and implementing programs to integrate the diaspora into every aspect of Armenian life. Um, when it comes to repatriation, it's a really big uh, sort of concept, and there is a lot of things that go into it, a lot of questions, everything from the policy level as to who is considered a repatriate. How do you define a repatriate compared to a regular immigrant that's not ethnically Armenian? Um, what, what are the kind of people that come to Armenia? Who are they? What kind of experiences do they have? What kind of professional background do they have? What's the catalyst that actually pushes them to make that move? Are they mainly professional people who are coming from Western countries that have a higher education um, and they're coming in because they can physically make this move, they wanna start a business, they wanna contribute professionally, or are they, is it people that are coming in from countries like Syria and Lebanon that are forced because of the economic situation, because of the political situation? Um, there's many, many aspects of this. Um, how do you treat people from different backgrounds? Um, how do you help them integrate into Armenia better? What can you do to provide services for the different kind of people that actually make that choice and move to Armenia, and especially the people who do not really have a choice, who make who come to Armenia because this is the only place that they can go? Um, what do you do for them? So for, I think, since Armenia's independence, we haven't really had an institutional approach to rep repatriation. And even with the Syrian war, we had thousands of people coming into Armenia, but no real institutional way of actually assisting them, providing social services for them. A lot of people went into this uh, kind of uh, 
conundrum of deciding whether they want to become citizens, whether they want to stay here, whether it benefits them to be a resident instead, whether they receive a refugee status or not. So it's a very uh, multi-level issue and it also needs multi-level solutions. And Another aspect of repatriation is the logistical end of the repatriation process. What do people actually do once they get here? What is the process that they need to go through? And there are two areas in, that our office has really uh, concentrated on throughout this year, actually three areas. Number one, we are working on a policy that actually defines who a repatriate is. How many years did they have to be absent from Armenia for them to be considered a repatriate? What kind of ethnic background do they need to be considered a repatriate? What's the difference between somebody who was born in the diaspora or somebody who was a migrant worker and has been living in Russia for the last 10 years but has decided to move back? So there are policy issues that we are working on. Uh, we're also working on professional repatriation. So helping bringing people in to actually work in the Armenian state system that have a professional background. Um, we have an EGORTS program that uh, over the last year brought in 50 uh, professionals from the diaspora from all kinds of places that are currently working in the Armenian government. And we are also working on the logistical end of repatriation by developing a repatriation and integration center. Um, this is predominantly the project that I've been working on since I started to work with the Office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs. So I'll talk a little bit about the repatriation and integration center because I think I, I see it as a really good solution for a, a gap that we have had um, in the last 30 years. Um, and it's, a, it's providing an institutional solution to this issue. So essentially the Repatriation Integration Center will serve as a one-stop shop for all inquiries related to repatriation. The center was, would function as a comprehensive resource to aid potential repatriates with every aspect of moving their lives, families, business ventures to Armenia. Um, it will demystify a process that is usually perceived as very complicated, conflicting, and sometimes inaccessible, especially because of language barriers. Um, once they are, uh, each diaspora in this process uh, will be assigned an integration specialist who will serve as their primary point of contact throughout the entire process and manage their case from A to Z. Prior to moving to Armenia, repatriates can contact the integration specialist through an online system. And once they have actually landed in Armenia, they will be, they, they will be able to access the integration specialist from a physical location in central Yerevan. Um, the repatriation specialist will speak the languages uh, that are dominant in the diaspora, predominantly Western Armenian, English, Russian, hopefully French, Arabic, and um, we'll hopefully be able to have the budget to actually expand and bring in a lot of multilingual people into the integration center. And it will be offering direct support to rep repatriates in a wide range of areas. Um, uh, including, but of course not limited to the acquisition of a legal status in Armenia, so acquiring citizenship, permanent residency, temporary residency, um, as well as um, how to import personal belongings to Armenia, how to import uh, business belongings to Armenia, registering an address, applying for so social uh, security numbers, um, assistance in purchasing or renting property, managing utilities, setting up bank accounts, applying for a driver's license, which is kind of a complicated process in Armenia. Uh, resources to facilitate finding employment, pensions, retirement planning, guidance in regards to child care, registering in schools, universities, kindergartens, um, the healthcare system, insurance versus public health care, um, accessing social services, and so on, as well as providing uh, Eastern Armenian language courses at the integration center for various uh, levels. Um, there will also be attorneys present at the, uh, at the integration center to assist people with any legal issues that they might have, um, as well as just general introduction to the Armenian legal system, paying taxes, registering a business, receiving a license, etc. Um, so that's essentially what the repatriation integration center will be. Um, we're very excited to be working on this because it's definitely a massive gap uh, in Armenia. This is a very difficult process for a lot of repatriates, especially for people who have language barriers um, to be able to, you know, they come in and they're stuck in this bureaucratic process where it doesn't really, they don't really understand, you know, what's, what, what are the steps? What are they supposed to be doing? Which office does what? We have a massive issue in Armenia with lack of signage for buildings. It's very difficult to know where you're even going. Um, so, 
by creating this one physical space and providing somebody an integration specialist that will be their guide and their sort of assistant uh, throughout the entire process, they we will be able to facilitate this process and make it a lot easier, make it a lot user friendly and hopefully a positive experience for most people and not a negative one and it's often perceived as a negative experience. Um, that's kind of the main concentration. Our office does it sees repatriation as essential for the future of Armenia, but we also understand that there are many aspects to repatriation that we alone cannot facilitate. There are economic issues, there are social service issues, there's education, um, and people do make that choice on their own when, uh, and they consider many, many aspects when they're moving to Armenia. So we're hoping that by uh, creating this first step, which is the integration center, we will be able to facilitate the logistical end while by bringing and professional support from the diaspora we will be able to create the all of the other um, steps and reduce the barriers as the integration process happens and bring repatriates to Armenia on a larger scale sooner than later because we do have a demographic issue in Armenia and it is something that we all of the ministries are supposed to be working on. Thank you Margarita um, and you respected time which is always much appreciated so uh, we have one comment from Jack Stepanyan on Facebook, um, or actually more of a question. Given the horrendous situation in Lebanon, is the Diaspora Commission planning to repatriate interested Lebanese Armenians to Armenia? Yes. So um, right prior to, um, during the Beirut blast, the first thing we did actually is we had um, the High Commissioner and our Chief of Staff, Saran Dragolian, uh, fly to Lebanon. And we had a huge interest from Lebanese Armenians who wanted to come to Armenia. And that interest sort of waned a little because of the war, but we've noticed that with the situation in Lebanon getting uh, significantly worse day by day, that this interest is still there. So this is a sort of strategic move uh, for Armenia, right? So we have this very vulnerable population that uh, needs to get out of Lebanon, that wants to move to Armenia. And we need to understand how do we target these people and how do we assist and bring them to Armenia. So on, uh, August, after August 3rd, within a month prior to the war, 2,000 people from Lebanon moved to Armenia. Um, we were tracking that. We, were, uh, we had a sort of questionnaire survey that we were passing out on all of the flights. And based on that, we developed an assistance package that would uh, provide social services to people who were in need who were moving to Armenia. And it's sad, but the assistance package was supposed to go to circulation in the government on September 27th. And we saw what happened. The war really shifted a lot of things and slowed down the entire process. But this is still of strategic importance to Armenia. And we are still working on finding the funding and finding the resources to be able to provide an assistance package to people coming in from Lebanon. Armenia is open. People are welcome to come from Lebanon to Armenia. And our office is assisting people on a regular basis. Um, so is Repat Armenia, by the way. Um, and everything, people are coming in and we are doing everything that I mentioned that the integration center will be doing, but on a bit of a smaller scale and not necessarily in the institutional way that we want it to be in the future. But this is a process that we are doing now. Um, so if you are in Lebanon and you need to come to Armenia, you are more than welcome to come. You are more than welcome to contact our office and we will assist you in every way possible, as well as if you need social services, registering you with social services and making sure that you actually get the assistance that you need. And we also have a lot of international partners and local partners and Armenian nonprofit organizations that provide a lot of assistance. For example, the Izmirian Foundation uh, provides free medical care to Lebanese Armenians and, Syrias, uh, and Syrian Armenians. So uh, um, to answer the question in a very long way, yes, uh, it's not institutionalized the way that it should be yet, but we are working on it. Great. Thank you, Margarita. And Jack is from Toronto, Canada, by the way. Thank you, Jack, for your question. Uh, let's move to our second panelist. And guys, uh, whoever's listening to us on Zoom and Facebook, please uh, post your comments and questions into the, into the Zoom chat, and I'll gladly read them out uh, to the panelists. Um, I know, David, you have to leave in about 12 minutes, so I'll go right straight to you. Talk to us about the economic benefits of immigration, what needs to get done from your perspective, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much for inviting me, guys. Uh, I'd like to start by saying, reminding ourselves that it's not just about Armenia. We're talking about the future Armenian was created to talk about the Armenian world, 
because there is no way the Armenian nation can exist without the Armenian state. And there's not much the Armenian state can do without the Armenian diaspora, right? So there's lots of nationalities around the world which don't have a country. Uh, so that, that's the first point I'd like to make. Second is, uh, so we've understood a long time ago, basically in economics, that's, that the most important thing for explosive economic growth is the speed of learning in the society, the speed of learning, the speed of acquiring knowledge, not capital, not labor, not land, but the speed with which you acquire knowledge. Now for Armenia, which is only $5,000 GDP per capita country, the opportunity is massive to go from 5,000 to 50,000 GDP per capita. That's what explosive growth is all about. Armenia can do that by acquiring the knowledge and the know-how from the Armenian diaspora, which lives in countries and economies with 40 to 50 to 60 thousand dollars GDP per capita. At the end of my talk, I'll, I'll put a link here on a small article we wrote showing that GDP per capita is linked to pretty much everything from healthcare to, uh, to income and everything else. That's the first point. The second point so, what's in it for Armenians from Armenia? I mean, that clearly the learning is there, the knowledge is there, the access to that knowledge basically almost for free is there. So that I think is, is pretty clear. What's in it for the Armenian diaspora, which is let's say 60 plus and over? Well, if the Armenian government and the Armenian state are able to create the right conditions for these people to move in, you know, organic food, uh, inexpensive care, um, then lower taxes even, then these people could think about moving to Armenia, right, as a residency. What's in it for the young people? The young part of the Armenian diaspora. Well, if Armenia can, if they are the two Armenian universities, the American University in Armenia, and the Russian Armenian University, two major universities, if they could step up, then a lot of Armenians would be willing to move to Armenia and study there. There's no reason why they wouldn't, but these universities have to step up. What's in it for the kids, for example, right? Five, six, seven, up to 16 years old. Well, if Armenia could implement <clears throat> quality boarding schools, Armenia today doesn't have a single boarding school. There's only one in UWC College, which, which I think is more than twenty-five or $30,000 a year, unless you're in a scholarship. But if Armenia could have boarding schools, say, which cost five to $10,000 a year, a lot of Armenian families would be willing to send their kids to these boarding schools, usually elderly, youth, kids, What's there for Armenian entrepreneurs? Well, Armenia must offer uh, flexible legislation, adaptive, um, competitive tax structure, access to the Eurasian Economic Union, which includes Russia, right? By being in Armenia, you can export to the Eurasian Economic Union tax-free, and you could do business with the European Union. So all of those parts of our diaspora, one by one, need to be interested in moving to Armenia. But the key is, Armenia can have explosive growth by having high rates of knowledge creation. And Armenia needs to create not just a learning economy, but learning society. Right? We have to create a learning society in Armenia. So it's, it's very simple. It's not difficult to do. The reason it's not difficult to do is because Armenia is very small, 3 million people. It's, it's not much. It's not even a one region in Russia, not the richest region. We just have to implement the right policies find the right model between the Armenian diaspora, the Armenian state, and the Armenian government. The triangle has to work. It's not working. It's not working because the Armenian diaspora is in shambles. I mean, different countries have different diasporas. They don't talk to each other. The Armenian state has serious problems, and the Armenian government has serious problems. The simple triangle, if we could fix that, we could easily have explosive growth to which people will then immigrate, emigrate, whatever you want to call it. So I don't want to go into a long monologue, but that's pretty much it, Alex, for me. Well, look, the questions are, and comments are pouring in, guys. So clearly, I think people are very interested by the topic. Uh, so look, David, I have a question for you from David Zargaryan from Ottawa. One difficulty I noticed during my last visit in Armenia was some repatriates were living hand to mouth. They were working two or three jobs 
but still not quite managing their expenses. It made me realize we should have a pan diaspora program to supplement the income for such families. One person I talked to told me if he and his wife could get $200 a month, even temporarily, they could finance their lives, including a seven-year-old daughter. Can we hope to create such a program? Would it be beneficial? What do you think, David? Yeah, I mean, we've tried this model for 30 years, giving people money, right? But that doesn't really work. Giving people businesses, giving people opportunity to make money is what we need. Now, I don't know why these guys aren't able to make more than 200 bucks a month in Armenia, because you can be a waiter and make more than that in Yerevan, especially in this season where you can't find a single spot in cafes and restaurants. Uh, but, but I think what diaspora needs to do, that the most diaspora can do for businesses in Armenia is help these businesses find a market share abroad. Diaspora from Russia can help them find markets in Russia. Diaspora from the US can help them. You know, this movement made in Armenia that started several months ago, where, you know, you go internet and then you try to buy things which are made in Armenia. That's a great movement. So we need things like that. And people make everything from glasses to tables. Everything we can help them export is much better than giving them money. One more thing we need to consider is helping Armenian kids who get great grades get accepted into best universities around the world. Uh, we have a lot of Armenians teaching in UCLA and MIT and Harvard and McGill and so on and so forth. We have to help these kids because they often miss that six month bridge to adapt from the Armenian system to the Western system. A little six month bridge can help them get into MITs of the world, get full scholarship, graduate and become successful uh, members of whatever society they're in and therefore strengthen our diaspora as well. That help, I believe in monetary transfers. I mean, remittances, as you know, right now we have what, two to $3 billion every year going to our media, just for us to understand, two to three billion, two slash three, that is, that's uh, more than, that's 25% of our media GDP. That is huge, right? That's, all, that's more than Canada's trade surplus, export minus import. And that's been happening for 30 years, but it hasn't really solved the problem, has it? So it's not just the remittances, we need to create the recurring business and learn again, learning society, I emphasize the same idea. Mm -hmm. Mar Margarita and David, I have a question from Vigen Simonian on Facebook, and then I'll go to Maral uh, as the next panelist. What are the incentives of diasporan Armenians to return to Armenia concerning, considering the political and security issues driving people away at the moment? What are the incentives? So, Margarita, you want to go ahead or should I go? Go ahead, David. So one of the incentives is that, yes, Armenia is poor, but we have to understand it is growing at 10% a year. So for a young entrepreneur who has trouble uh, getting ahead in a mature market like Canada or US or Europe, where every, all market shares are taken, this could be a good opportunity to start from Armenia and then move into mature markets. I think this is one. The second one could be, you can actually, there are certain degrees, you could get very good degrees in Armenia, in computer science, in math, in physics, you can get them in English, and then you can do master's degrees or PhDs in the developed world. That's another thing you can do. Thirdly, the amount of knowledge you've accumulated in these developed countries is actually needed in a place like Armenia. So you, you should, again, I'm reading the question in Zoom again, that you know, I misunderstood that it's not 250, 700 bucks, Whatever it is, you can find, if you're qualified, educated, you can find even $2,000, $3,000 jobs in Yerevan today. But still, I think moving to Yerevan is not for people who are looking forward. To, I'm not saying Yerevan because I don't think there's you know, much point in discussing places outside of Yerevan. It's just not serious. So let's just talk about Yerevan, which is a million people city, which is still pretty big. Um, it is still not to go get, get salaries, but it's to bring your business with you bring your ideas with you. I think that is what people should be looking at, not getting to Yerevan to, uh, to get a salary. Yeah, if I can just add to that, um, I think incentives wise, uh, one of the main things that I have noticed personally as somebody living here is the lifestyle in Armenia. Um, so that's the predominant reason why a lot of people also young people come and stay a lot of people who, for example, do repat Armenia or some kind of volunteer program is because they actually like the lifestyle here. Um, 
incentives in regards to business opportunities, there's actually quite a lot. There are two um, institutions that uh, assist and help with um, businesses in Armenia, including the Armenian National Interest Fund, which just signed a major deal with a company from Dubai to work on renewable energy in Armenia. And there's also the uh, Investment Support Center in the Ministry of Economy that assists with small and medium-sized businesses. So it's a really great opportunity. A lot of things are untouched in Armenia. A lot of industries are untouched in Armenia. So um, for a lot of investors, this is a great place to start their business to have, or to bring um, a certain industry. The tech industry is growing exponentially. So that's an area that we can really concentrate in and bring in various uh, diasporan uh, businesses into Armenia. We are trying to work to create some kind of specific investments. There is no specific incentive to, let's say, uh, just a regular uh, international investment compared to like an Armenian diaspora investment. Our constitution does not put a difference between them. And that's predominantly because we can't because of the various international treaties that we are part of. It would kind of be considered discrimination. Uh, but but in general, there are areas that uh, there are government incentives and tax in incentives that you can take advantage of if you're thinking about moving to Armenia to start a business. And I do want to reflect on something else. Uh, in regards to the first question about you know making two hundred dollars a month or even three hundred dollars a month, there are people in Armenia who are making less, and I do not want to say this to discourage people from moving. It is a reality for a lot of people. It is a very you know you wait until your paycheck to be able to buy food. That is the reality for a lot of people in Armenia. But we cannot simply uh, sort of just assume that that's the status quo and then not do anything to uh, change that. And I really like what David mentioned with uh, regards to professionals bringing their own uh, experiences and expertise with their education from uh, inst international institutions into Armenia and changing something from within. Uh, we do need, we, we had a massive brain drain in Armenia in the 90s. I think people tend to forget that. We had a lot of professional people leave uh, because of the economic situation, because of the post-war situation. And unfortunately, there's a threat that that can happen again. So as a diaspora, we really have to think about, well, what can we do? What is my personal incentive to move to Armenia and perhaps what's the country's incentive and what can I do personally to make that contribution that is more than simply donating money or participating in charity, but bringing your professional skills into Armenia. And a lot of industries need that. There is a massive need for that. So I see it as a symbiotic relationship. Without the diaspora, we really can't become the future Armenia that we want to become. So Alex, I'm, I'm going to take off, which I just make two, two, uh, three points before I go. Please go ahead. First, the first one is, so again, the point is that we all start speaking in one voice. The Armenian diaspora and the Armenian world needs to learn to speak in one voice. We know what we want. We know what we need, but nobody articulates this clearly enough so that the government also understands that there is an Armenian world out there. The Armenian world has a vision of its future. And this is what the Armenian world is saying we need. That's my point number one. My point number two, I'm posting a link here uh, to an article about GDP per capita, how it explains a lot of things. And my point number three is anybody who has lived in any developing country understands the importance of what Margarita is doing. Uh, it's a disaster everywhere. These are these difficulties are in any developing country. In places like Canada, we take it for granted. You know, you come here, you get your passport, you go there, you know. In developing countries, even in a place like Dubai, which arguably is, not, is no longer developing, it's not easy to settle. So you have Margarita's contact, keep it, because if you think about even getting a residency, you're going to need it. So again, thanks very much, guys. And thank you, David. Have a great uh, The best. Thank you very much. Sunday. Bye bye. So on, on that note, uh, Mara, I'd like to go to you. Uh, you have two brothers who've repatriated. You've gone to Armenia so many times. You just came back from Armenia because your, one of your brothers got married. Uh, look, t tell us from a young professional perspective, like what is the opportunity in Armenia for young professionals? What's happening on the ground for real? And especially for those of us who, can't, who haven't been able to travel for many years to Armenia. Go ahead. So first of all, when uh, my brothers found out that I was doing this talk and uh, explaining the benefits of living in Armenia for a young professional, they both started laughing at me like, here I am the one member of the family living in Canada and I'm going to talk about the benefits of living in Armenia, you know. 
So I'll take it on a different angle. Like I'll, I'll talk about the benefits that they've explored while moving to Armenia. So firstly, on a social aspect, um, life has gotten easier and easier for, especially for expats, as in for people who have income coming from uh, foreign places uh, moving to Armenia. Uh, just generally, the nightlife is great. Restaurants, there, every time I go to Armenia, there are more and more restaurants. And with the arrival of the Syrian Armenians and the Lebanese Armenian, uh, customer service has exponentially improved. It's, it's really impressive. I mean, I remember the first time I went to Armenia, I've been to Armenia eight times now. So the first time I went to Armenia was around 2000 and uh, 2000, 2000, 2003. And uh, I mean, you would order something and it was like an order up in the air. You'd order something just for the formality. No one would take notes and whatever you received was what you received. It was like Russian roulette, you didn't know. But nowadays it's like you get there, sir, customer service is great. I remember I went to Mairig and, and uh, the owner of the restaurant or the manager, excuse me, walked up to us after our dinner, uh, checked on us, asked us to rate them on TripAdvisor. Like the the improvement is is immense and it's, it's very noticeable. So that's one. Uh, it's also just a fun and exciting place if you're young. It's, it's small enough that uh, you always bump into somebody you know on the street, but it's large enough that you're always meeting new people. Um, the women are beautiful. So if you're a young man looking to uh, settle down, get married, create a family, I mean, Armenia is a great place. Uh, if you're a young woman looking to make a family, I mean, the men are charming. They're charming. <laughs> um, and it's just fun. I mean, um, you you have a lot of different cultures. Uh, nowadays, when you go to Armenia, uh, you walk down the street and you hear all, all kinds of different languages. Um, you have, I mean, the benefit of Armenia that's different from other locations in the world is that you have that perfect mix of a homey feeling because you're surrounded by people of same culture, you're Armenian, uh, you have the same values, um, and you learn about it in school. And then you, but you also get that excitement of meeting Armenians from different regions. Uh, you know, last time I went, I mean, the people, like I met a lot of Russian Armenians, Iranian Armenians, Mexican Armenians, uh, Argentinian Armenians. Uh, obviously, a lot of American Armenians, Australian Armenians. There's these two Australians that uh, opened an American diner <laughs> in Yerevan near Cascade. Uh, so I don't know. It's just uh, it's so diverse yet homey. I find it was the perfect balance. So that's on a on a social aspect. Uh, maybe one thing I'd like to add is that. If you are looking, if you're a young professional, you're looking to start a family in Armenia, uh, or you're just looking to start a family in general, the benefit of moving to Armenia to start your family, and is part of the reasons my brother Patrick moved to Armenia, is because you're so surrounded by a strong community that you get a lot of help. I mean, raising a kid, Alexandre, you can vouch for this, it's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> but uh, I can see my brother Rafi, Rafi and his, uh, his lovely wife Marianne, they had two children, and the family is always there like the aunts are there the grandmother is there the neighbor is there the uh, everyone's a cousin so everyone's always there you get so much support from the community it's it's way different it's light years from what it is here we're just physically in montreal uh, or in toronto for instance just because of ge geographic location your house is in laval and your mother lives in ndg it's just more complicated whereas in armenia it's just everybody's so close and they all they're always with family so it's just easier to raise a family. Uh, on a business side of things, um, I would like to go back to that culture aspect that I said. So uh, I spoke on the social side that it was interesting to have all these Armenians from different cultures, but um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the nomad capitalist. He's, um, he's an economist, I wanna say, uh, who has a YouTube channel and a whole business around, uh, around where to be most successful in business or, or what countries can, uh, he gives you tips on how you can succeed by like uh, bringing business to a foreign location. And when he spoke about Armenia, he said that the main benefit was because of all the Armenian um, uh, diaspora that go back to Armenia and uh, they come they come to Armenia and they give tips and tricks and they they bring the external Western culture to influence local Armenian culture. You can see that the work culture in Armenia is much better than the other co working cultures in the region. So he compares it to Georgia most 
mostly because his main business is based out of Tbilisi. And he says that the difference is is very clear. Like in Armenia, there's so much uh, external influence that, as I said, every time you go back to Armenia, you can notice a difference uh, and an improvement. And uh, he said in terms of work culture, uh, it's it's really great to find employees there, to find partners there, et cetera. Uh, on another note, it's just inexpensive. Uh, I mean, it costs it, it, it costs less to do your groceries there, to buy your, uh, to go to a restaurant there, to uh, start your business. Just, it, just main expenses are, are less expensive. <laughs> your main costs are less expensive. And uh, if you are in the case of a, um, somebody who can work remote from anywhere, so you're, you're a nomad worker, uh, you are taxed less if you're working out of Armenia. So I don't know all the details about that, but uh, my brother actually has a whole uh, uh, talk about that. My brother, Patrick, he also started um, a group called Work From Armenia. Uh, they ha they're basically uh, writing up all the benefits for to start your business in Armenia or to bring your business in Armenia. So you get foreign investments and in, you're bringing them into Armenia. So I think that's a really interesting uh, link. I'll post a link in the chat after. Please, please do, Marav. Um, so there are two really interesting questions, guys, and I want to throw a bit of cold water on this conversation, but we, we have to do it, right? Because they're good questions. Uh, and they're both linked. So one is from on Facebook from Narine Hachatrian, Hachatrian from Cincinnati in America. Hello, in my opinion, first of all, we need to talk about how we stop emigration from Armenia. Is there some actions that we can do? So that's keep that question in mind. And now I'm going to read a question from Vigen Simonian on Facebook as well. So both questions are linked. Guys, I would want you to respond to the fundamental question. If everything is so good, why are so many people still leaving the country or on their, su on the, their suitcases? Are they less informed or less patriotic than those who make the decision based on such workshops? Unless you respond to this question, this is all going to be a very limited party for the selected few. So there's a bit of, of skepticism and, and I, I'd like you Mara maybe and Margarita to respond to that skepticism. Um, maybe Mara go first and then Margarita. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll respond from, I mean, I, I think Margarita is a much better place to, to answer the question because I don't understand, um, I don't know all the facts of Armenians living in Armenia, but from my understanding, from an external perspective, I mean, I, I do understand it. it. It is difficult, like we're naming all the positives, but there are a lot of uh, difficult sides to it. Uh, I think that if you're past a certain age, it's difficult to find a job. Uh, here, we're talking mostly about bringing your business to Armenia or creating business in Armenia. But I think that if you're if you're born and raised in Armenia and you have a certain mindset and uh, you are past an age where you think it's, I mean, you're you're more looking for work. You don't have that entre entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit. I do agree that it's it is much more difficult. And I also think that um, a lot of people in Armenia have been through a lot. And at this point, they are trying to look for opportunity elsewhere. They have a family member who went to Russia and found a job. So for them, let me go to Russia to find, find a job. I'm sick of going through what I'm going through in Armenia. So that's my external uh, perspective. Margarita? Sure. Um, I think uh, Maral actually touched on the right point there. Um, it, to throw a bit of cold water on the conversation, economics and security. Those are the two reasons why people leave Armenia. Um, when you think about um, Armenia since independence and what we were like in 1991 when we did formally declared independence from the Soviet Union, we were actively at war. Um, we were blockaded from all sides. Simple things like electricity and gas were nowhere to be found. And when we think about um, what, what that actually created. And for a lot of people in the diaspora, this is very foreign, uh, but my parents and, you know, where I was born at a time where we had no electricity. So um, the early nineties are considered the dark years in Armenia and a lot significant amount has changed since then. Um, we had this massive amount of immigration happened out of Armenia in the early 90s and the rates have slowed down, but they have not slowed down to where we want them to be. Um, and to really reflect on uh, the reality for most people in Armenia, for working class people in Armenia, it is very difficult to live here. It is difficult in the sense that if they are living on a day-to-day, -day, every paycheck and uh, 
that that really makes a difference and it does not matter how patriotic you are if you cannot put food in front of your kids at the end of the day you are going to look for a way out you are going to try to find some change and i take this very personally too it's not just the reality in armenia this is the reality that my parents went through um, i think if we had a choice in 2004 we would have stayed but our parents were faced with the choice of how do we provide for three kids with the jobs that we have, having the two industries that my parents worked in prior to the Soviet Union collapse no longer existing once Armenia had declared independence. So that, that's the reality. If people do not feel comfortably economically to stay, they are not going to. So how do we change this? And uh, economic growth is the main factor that we all need to look into. And economic growth isn't going to happen on its own. It takes a lot of policies. It takes a lot of regional politics as well. And I think it also takes the role of the diaspora as well. I think this is what I meant by it's a symbiotic relationship is we the diaspora has a massive potential to provide this growth in Armenia and getting the diaspora to actually invest in Armenia, to work in Armenia, to bring their businesses in Armenia, to create the jobs that people would need in order for them to feel comfortable and stay is very, very important. Um, and I think a lot of people in the diaspora do need to sort of shift their thinking a little bit and think about, well, is, is Armenia a viable business uh, opportunity for us can we actually move our business to Armenia and that's a step that needs to be taken mm -hmm. and of course we also cannot talk about immigration without talking about security we just experienced a very devastating war we're now experiencing the political aftermath of that very devastating loss and um, for many people this was maybe a final straw for them for a lot of people who have you know, young men in the household that are 17, 16, 14 years old who are thinking, do I want my kid to go to war? Do I want them to participate? How do I save my child? And it's a very human way of reacting to things. And it's not because they are less patriotic. Um, it is because no family wants to lose a child as patriotic as they are. That this is not something that people want to go through. And I think it's also very important to speak very frankly about the fact that working class people and people who actually go to the army and participate in combat are also linked together because many working class people do not have the privilege of taking their kid and having them receive Russian citizenship, which is a pretty common practice amongst upper class people in Armenia, where uh, you know, they take them at a young age to another country, they receive citizenship, and they, they come and they live in Armenia, or they are able to pay their way out of military service. This was quite common, uh, especially within the previous administrations as well. Um, and security is a big issue and you have to be realistic when you're here and we also in the diaspora have to be realistic about how we look at armenia and whether we are willing to you know take those sacrifices and make those sacrifices as well and for both of those things in my opinion and i think the position of our office is the same is that for both security and the development of armenia economically we see the diaspora as an essential and very very important factor and it is mm -hmm. up to all of us to figure out how do we change and improve and uh, integrate the diaspora and the diaspora's relationship with Armenia post-war, because what we saw during the war was that whatever structures and relationships that we had largely failed. And by you need to, we all need to reflect on that and think about how do we change? How do we improve these things? And the diaspora's role in that is essential in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, good answer to a complicated, two complicated questions. Uh, there's a question from David Zargaryan that I'll just a comment that I'll read out uh, that responds to what both of you, Maral and Mar uh, Margarita, just said. Another factor to bear in mind that might explain partly emigration is that Armenia is a tiny country and internet has made the youth realize there is a huge world out there and they simply want to explore it. They are simply curious. The diasporans have seen a good part of the world and are curious about Armenia. I think we shouldn't get spooked by the emigration too much. Many of them will likely come back once they've satisfied their curiosities. So a bit of a positive comment there. Thank you, David. Yeah. And I and, think just to, yeah, if you don't mind to reflect on that, um, just to add on that, that it is a thing, uh, a conversation that I've had before and something that people have talked about. And when people are able to get visas much easier to go and visit different countries 
and uh, they are able to do that. It's uh, it's more you know you have more freedom. You can go and come back when it's very difficult to get a, to get a visa. You feel kind of stuck that you're in one place. So mm -hmm. perhaps for Armenian foreign policy, it's a good idea to actually think about how do we develop these visa free um, you know relationships with various countries and create uh, much cheaper flights. So we have a lot of flights coming in and out of Europe that were implemented throughout the last year. Prior to COVID, we had the very, very cheap European lines flying in and then COVID happened and they stopped. So, you know, working on that and developing uh, those that will not only encourage tourism from Europe to Armenia, but also it will encourage Armenians to go and then come back because it will be very affordable. And if we have a visa free process or a very easy way of obtaining a visa to visit various countries, a lot of people for them will be just a trip, not, you know, I feel stuck here and I want to leave. Yeah, of course. A good point. So uh, our last panelist, Sevan, you have an interesting perspective. You were a repatriate who actually ended up coming back to Canada and was maybe thinking of going back. So look, you've lived repatriation. Talk to us about it. And uh, I, just for everyone watching us, I've seen all of your questions and comments. So there's a few more I'd like to get in before we end the session. So go ahead, Sevan. Sure. In that case, I'll go as fast as I can. Kind of um, good. Take your time. <laughs> A bit of my experience. So in 2017, I finished university and then um, with the suggestion of my brother, I ended up applying for Birthright Armenia and going to volunteer for supposedly six months. I got to Armenia, I moved to Gumri for a couple of months and I think within a week of being in Gumri, I was like, I'm not leaving. Didn't tell my parents yet because I knew it would become like a contention point, but I knew already that this is where I was supposed to be. And then eventually my parents came, we had a discussion, they were against it, then they were, then they finally gave me the okay of, okay, you can stay longer. Um, not really knowing how long I would stay or anything, but I did end up after my six months with birthright, I found a really good job with uh, the last place I volunteered. Um, and I ended up staying for an extra year. I got my residency, I started applying for my citizenship. Eventually my citizenship I just got uh, once I moved back to Canada, but, I have to say that working in Armenia, moving to Armenia and hopefully moving back, um, I had an incredible time. I gained um, unmatchable um, life experiences. As Maral said, the social life of it, the light life is incredible. There's no doubt about that compared to what it was in 2012, even when I went for the first time, completely different. Uh, but I also understand the other side of it, where yes, I had a very good job, so it was easier for me. I had the support of my family back in Canada, so it was a little bit easier for me to um, come from a developed country with my experiences, with finding a very good paying job for someone living in Armenia. But I also understand the other side where, yes, people with their families are having a harder time. So. I do get both sides of it, um, but I think the way I did it, where I started as a volunteer and then found a job, really helped my decision in staying longer. Yes, in the end, I ended up coming back for a multiple, multitude of other reasons, but I do hope to go back very soon, especially now that I'm a citizen and, I don't know, figure out a way to kind of balance my life in Canada with a life in Armenia, because I must say that being here for now, it's been two years. It's been very hard. And every time the subject of Armenia opens up, people around me realize that my face just lights up because of how much I miss it and how much Armenia has made an impact. That one and a half years has made an impact on my life. And uh, yeah, so I have that experience. What, what, maybe Sevan, just one minute, like just tell us what, what were those downsides that made you come back to this very cold country that we live in? <laughs> hey, look, I'm a December baby in Quebec. So cold is not a worry for me. Um, but I think, I think David was saying that we take it for granted coming from a developed country. And that is very mm. true. Um, I think the, yes, the economic factors, but also there were some socio-political factors like, uh, the ease at which women can do or say whatever they want here. Whereas in Armenia, yes, it's changing. I don't want to say it's not, but there's still it's very not as advanced as here. And so for a feminist like myself, it was very hard for me to get on that side of, to get used to that. And I think that was one of the major factors for me to say, okay, I need to, I need to get myself out of here for a little bit and then come back because it was taking a, a, a toll on me. And I don't wanna discourage anyone because that was my experience, but I also had the best experiences. Um, 
so that 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 I think was the main thing for me that I just needed to take myself out of it for a little bit and then eventually go back uh, but that yeah okay well thank you Sevan and I think uh, Armenia would benefit from you repatriating one day so uh, keep us posted on that front and uh, now you know Margarita so you know who to reach I out to the, the diaspora I, office I'm so excited about Margarita and the the project the center because if that center existed yes I had help from the HR to get my re uh, residency and try to apply for citizenship but having a center like what you are talking about I'm so excited about it I've taken notes I'm ready to come back and like connect with you guys and it's a very exciting project and I'm, I'm excited to see it happen. Thank you, Sevan. So there's a few comments and questions I'd like to get in. One really interesting one from Arad Andrew Banis Khacha Durian. As someone considering entrepreneurship in Armenia, we've talked a lot about the, nest, the need for entrepreneurship in Armenia. Um, one thing worrying me is the high courier costs, which can make a product uncompetitive, particularly for smaller volumes of products that are shipped. I see this as a major roadblock for Armenian development. Do you know of any developments in improving these trade routes, perhaps from a southern access to the sea? Margarita, do you, are you aware of any of this? I'm going to be very honest. I am not aware of. I do uh, know what he's talking about in regards to high carrier costs. I think that uh, has to do a lot with the lack of competition in, uh, in the market in Armenia in regards to international carriers. Um, so it is an issue and hopefully our Ministry of Economy is working on solving some of those issues, but I personally do not know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I order Ararat boxes and the high post fees are like so high. It's crazy. So uh, yeah. as a customer, and we actually, I, yeah, we yeah. actually approached high post our office formally. We tried to talk to them and essentially said that the, they, those are their rates. And we had some dialogue with them, but unfortunately we could not get very far. Okay, good to know. Um, then we have, uh, we have a few other comments, but uh, Vasken Garibian, who I believe lives in Toronto now, how the future Armenian, how is the future Armenian going to co collaborate with the current government? So, I mean, the founders of future Armenian have said that they do want to collaborate with the state and we'll get back to you Vasken with a more thorough answer. We don't have that answer at this stage in the game. I mean, the election just happened. And well, the goal for now for the future Armenia is to reach that 100,000 signatories and to show the, the state and the government to that there's a lot of broad support not in Armenia and across the world for these initiatives. And we're obviously inviting uh, government agencies to attend these events and to, uh, to talk with our signatories, including yourself. And that's why Margarita and other members of the state are gonna be joining us in the next few weeks as well. Uh, but that's a good question. Thank you, Vaskin. And we have a few more minutes. Um, the, Viken Simonian uh, has another comment. So thank you, Viken, for being very active today. The elephant in the room is that as you draw a rosy picture, estimated hundreds are in Azerbaijan detention. So the, the POWs, the foreign debt is growing by a billion dollars a year. The government policy around staffing the crucial position is flawed which means that the issues have no real perspectives to be resolved. There are so many issues that are being ignored that it's a bit hypocritical to invite more people. Sorry, guys. So again, um, as you know, everyone who's attending, we do read out negative comments as well or comments that are a bit uh, different from what panelists say. So that's part of the conversation. So thank you for sharing that. Um, here, uh, we, we have Varges, uh, who's a Canadian founder and medical director of Maple Leafs Armenian Canadian Medical Clinic in Yerevan. I'm doing business and charity missions since 2012, and I'd be happy to share my experience with you. Thank you, Vardes, for, for sharing that with us. Um, and one last question from Arad Andrew Banis Khachadurian, who I believe lives in, lives in Toronto. Uh, thanks for the previous answer. That still gives me ideas for improvement. Uh, broad question, but generally, what can diasporans expect from the diaspora office? And I think that's a good way of ending today's discussion, Margarita. What can we expect from your office? So it's a pretty simple answer. We are your bridge to the Armenian government and to Armenia in general. Um, that's what we serve as. So anything that you need. 
Um, we are doing our best to represent the Armenian diaspora within the Armenian government. It's a very fundamental uh, sort of stepping stone that we are placing by recruiting the, that, that members of the Armenian diaspora to work in Armenia. And we want to represent your voice in the Armenian government, and we want to assist you in the diaspora as well. So um, our communities have issues throughout the world. Some are very, very well organized, some are not very well organized, connecting you with one another, connecting you to Armenia in whatever way that you need. Anything from whether you just want to move to Armenia, whether you're visiting Armenia, whether you are bringing your business to Armenia, we are here to assist you and to be your voice. And we also hear all of your concerns. I think it's very important uh, for the diaspora to know this, that we listen to you and we hear your concerns as well. And there are plenty of issues and we completely understand that there's also a lot of disappointment and a lot of um, discouragement that's going on in the diaspora as well and we listen to you and we take your considerations and we also reflect those to the Armenian government as well so um, we are here to represent your voice. Thank you very much Margarita and on that note we're about to hit noon eastern time and we promised we would end right on time. So we've had almost 50 people attend today, which is even significantly more than the first event. For those who are attending today, please note that you'll be receiving emails from the Future Armenian over the next few weeks for numerous more discussions about immigration. We hope to have the Immigration Ministry join us at our next conversation and a few other uh, guest speakers to speak about immigration and repatriation because we know how uh, popular it is as a topic and how important it is. And that's goal number nine of the Future Armenian. On that note, for those in Canada and the United States, have a great rest of your Sunday and enjoy your afternoon. And for those in Armenia like Margarita, enjoy your evening, have fun. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.